All right, Ninja Nerds, in this video, we are gonna talk about thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so now what we gotta do before we start talking about all the indications and mechanism of action and side effects of thiazide diuretics, we gotta go over the basic physiology within the nephron. But we're focusing on here, we're really zooming in on the cellular level at a particular part of the nephron, and that's where these drugs primarily work. What is that part? Well, the main part that I want you to remember here is that these drugs act on the distal convoluted tubule. Well, where is that? So let's imagine here, I have my Bowman's capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, thin descending limb of the loop of Henle, then I got my hairpin turn, I move up, and I have my ascending limb. And the ascending limb, you know it has two portions, right? You have a thin portion, and then you got that thick portion. Then after that, it makes that turn around the cortex at the distal convoluted tubule, and then it turns around again and works its way back down into the collecting duct. We're focusing primarily on this portion. We're zooming in on that area. Now, one thing I want you to remember is, is when we're talking about thiazide and thiazide diuretics, we're talking about their pertinence when it comes to high blood pressure, right? Because they're commonly used in high blood pressure. They have other indications we'll talk about. But the way that they help with blood pressure is by controlling sodium chloride. So what you need to remember here is that in the distal convoluted tubule, around five to maybe 10% of the sodium chloride is actually resorbed in that segment. So if we can inhibit sodium chloride reabsorption, what follows sodium chloride? Water. So let's talk about how if we decrease sodium chloride absorption, we decrease water reabsorption and therefore drop blood volume and blood pressure. So let's look and zoom in on one of these distal convoluted tubular cells. We have two of them here. This is gonna be where we talk about normal physiology and here we'll talk about how the drug works and its mechanism of action. First thing you need to know, on this apical surface, right? So we're zooming in. If we were to kind of imagine where we are in this point, we're zooming in and we're looking at the cells at this point, okay? So right here, we're looking at their luminal surface. On this end here, this is their basolateral surface. That's this portion. And that's where the two paratubular capillaries are gonna be present, okay? Now, first thing is imagine that the tubule is carrying with it filtrate. And one of the main components of the filtrate in this area is sodium chloride. There's a special transporter here, and we're gonna call this NCC, sodium chloride co-transporter, okay? And what this does is, is it moves sodium and it moves chloride from the tubular lumen into the tubular cell. So we're basically take, imagine here's these little dots, that's sodium chloride, we're moving it from in the tubular lumen and into the cell. Okay, now once they get into the cell, here we're gonna have sodium, here we're gonna have chloride. Again, the main one I want us to focus on here is sodium. Now, we have to get sodium into the blood because that's the whole goal here of this normal physiological process. So how do we do that? Well, what happens is sodium has two ways that it can get out of the cell. One of the ways is there's a very special transporter here called a sodium potassium ATPase, and it's a very prominent pump that's found in every cell in our body. And it pumps out three sodium ions and pumps into the cell two potassium ions. So that's how we get the sodium out into the blood. That's one way. The other way is that sodium also can get back into the cell, right? You know how, like, you know one of the big things here? We get sodium out via the sodium potassium ATPase. But then what happens is sodium will move from this extracellular fluid, some of it, will move back into the cell. When it moves back into the cell, it actually allows for something to move out of the cell. And what is that thing? That thing that moves out of the cell as sodium moves into the cell is calcium. Now, when calcium moves out here into the blood, now the concentration of calcium, when it moves from the cell and into the blood, what happens to the concentration of calcium in this cell? Well, the calcium concentration is going to decrease. As a result, there's a small amount of calcium that's remaining in the distal convoluted tubule. And usually, in order for it to get reabsorbed, it's dependent upon a particular hormone called parathyroid hormone, okay?
We're not going to focus on all that right now. I just want you to understand this basic concept. Now, calcium concentrations might be a little bit higher out here. Now, if the calcium concentration in the cell is low because we're pushing calcium out by bringing sodium in, what does that do? Well, that creates a concentration gradient where calcium is going to want to move from the tubular lumen and into the cell. And then from in the cell, where does it go? Again, utilized by that sodium calcium exchanger, we pump sodium into the cell and pump calcium out of the cell and into the paratubular capillary blood. What's the result of all this? Well, one is I can put calcium in the bloodstream, more calcium in the bloodstream. The other thing is I can increase my sodium concentration in the bloodstream. One thing you want to remember, whenever you have a lot of salt concentration, high salt concentration in the blood, that creates an osmotic gradient. And that osmotic gradient is gonna to wanna to pull water, which is also gonna be in this tubular lumen. It's gonna to wanna to drag water via through the aquaporins. It's gonna to wanna to drag that water into the blood, okay? And as a result, we'll bring decent amounts of water into the bloodstream. So normal physiology is we're going to try to retain sodium and chloride thereby pulling water with us and we can also help to regulate the calcium levels in the blood as well via that sodium calcium exchanger. Now, what do thiazide diuretics do? What I want you to remember is they do not like that sodium chloride co-transporter. They're not a big fan of that sodium chloride co-transporter. So what they're gonna do is they're going to inhibit him, okay? What does that do then? Well, let's follow along. Remember what was responsible, what this protein was responsible for doing. Well, it was responsible for moving sodium into the actual tubular cell and moving chloride into the tubular cell from the tubular lumen. But if you inhibit this, that means that there's going to be less sodium being brought into the cell, less chloride being brought into the cell. Now remember, how does sodium get out of the cell? Remember, Sodium, it gets out of the cell via this sodium potassium ATPase. And remember, what it does is it pumps three sodium ions out, right? But because there's less sodium coming into the cell via this sodium chloride co-transporter, less sodium's coming in, that means that less sodium is going to be pumped into the paratubular capillary blood via this sodium potassium ATPase. It's simple logic there, right? Less sodium in the cell, less for us to pump out. There's less sodium then. That's one big goal. Remember we said that was one of the goals of thiazide and thiazide like diuretics. And again, if you really want to remember, chloride has its own special channel that it can actually also get out here as well. And so we decrease chloride concentration. Remember, what did I tell you happens though? And if you, want, if you really want, we can also remember here that whenever you pump three sodium out, you also pump two potassium in. But again, you're pumping less potassium into the cell because there's less activity of the sodium potassium ATPase. So again, decrease sodium potassium ATPase activity. Decrease sodium entry across via the sodium chloride co-transporter. Less sodium chloride in the blood. Now, because there's less sodium, okay? Now remember what happens here. Less sodium is in the cell, right? There's decreased concentration of sodium in the cell because you're not bringing sodium from the tubular lumen into the tubular cell. What does that do then? Now, because this creates a concentration gradient. Now I know that I said there's low amounts of sodium in the blood, but if you're comparing the sodium in the blood to the sodium in the tubular cell, it's much higher in concentration. So I'm just for a second, I'm going to flip this arrow. And then the only reason I want you guys to remember this is because sodium concentration in the blood is much higher than the sodium concentration in the cell. Now, because of that, where's the sodium going to want to go? From, in, from outside the cell, inside the cell. And it's going to want to go a lot more than usual. It's going to flood in. Now, every time these sodium molecules rush into the cell, what has to rush out of the cell? Calcium. So now, because of that, calcium is also going to have to rush out of the cell and into the blood. So what does that mean? That means I'm gonna have an increased calcium concentration in the blood. Now, if I pull tons and tons and tons of calcium from inside of the cell into the blood, what happens to the calcium concentration inside the cell then? Well, it's gonna drop a little bit because I'm pushing a lot of it out into the blood. 
So what's that gonna do now? Now the calcium that's out here in the tubular lumen, it's gonna get driven in to the cell and get utilized to get pumped where? Out of the cell into the paratube of the capillaries. If we go back to what we said here before, there's less sodium, less chloride. That means there's less salt, less of an osmotic gradient to drive water movement. That means that if we think about the movement of water from the tubular lumen and into the blood, what's gonna happen? There's gonna be less movement of water. Now, what does that overall tell you? The overall purpose here. We're going to decrease sodium and chloride movement into the blood, right? As a result, that's gonna decrease water movement. If I decrease the sodium chloride and water movement, what's that gonna to do to the overall blood volume? It's gonna decrease my blood volume, okay? And that can play a role within blood pressure and in fluid overload states. The other thing I want you to remember is, what else do we say that the high diuretics do? They pull calcium into the bloodstream. And so they can also increase the calcium reabsorption. And if we increase calcium reabsorption, there's a benefit of that, especially in patients who maybe are osteopenic, osteoporotic, or patients who have already have a high amount of calcium in their kidneys, in their kidney tubules. What kind of people have lots of calcium in their kidney tubules and it can crystallize and precipitate, make nasty little stones? People who are more prone to calcium oxalate, calcium phosphate kidney stones. So that's where we can see the significance of these drugs. Okay, now that we understand the overall mechanism of action, let's talk about the two different types of drugs. And again, what do we say that there were? There were thiazide diuretics. So again, one are gonna be the thiazide diuretics. And the others are going to be the thiazide-like diuretics. I want you to remember particularly two thiazide diuretics and two thiazide-like diuretics that are commonly utilized. One of the thiazide diuretics that is commonly utilized, you hear a lot, is called hydrochlorothiazide, sometimes abbreviated HCTZ. The other type is going to be chlorothiazide. Now, the other drugs that I want you guys to remember here are going to be the thiazide-like diuretics. And remember, these all have pretty much the same mechanism of action. They inhibit the sodium chloride co-transporter. The thiazide-like diuretics are a little bit also interesting because some of them have been shown to be a little bit more effective. One of them is called chlorthalidone. So chlorthalidone is one. The other one that's commonly utilized is called metolazone. And if you guys remember from the congestive heart failure video, we talked about how this can be utilized in patients with congestive heart failure. Whenever you're utilizing like a loop diuretic and you need just a little bit of extra sodium and water pull, you can utilize this drug. So again, what I want you to remember is there's thiazide diuretics, thiazide-like diuretics, both have the same mechanism of action. Hydrochlorothiazide, chlorothiazide are part of your thiazide diuretics and the thiazide-like diuretics are chlorthaldone and metolazone. One other thing that I'm gonna mention here is that the thiazide-like diuretics have sulfa component to them, okay? So technically, what you need to remember is that these technically have a sulfa component in their structure. So why is that significant? In patients who maybe have sulfa allergies, you might not wanna be giving these patients that kind of drug. And we'll talk about why, because it might lead to a particular type of reaction called an acute interstitial nephritis. Last thing I wanna mention here with these thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics, is there's also been one other mechanism of action that's been proposed with these, but again, they don't know the complete underlying physio uh, physiology of it. But what they know is that thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics have the ability to promote vasodilation. And if you cause vasodilation, what does that do? Well, that decreases the total peripheral resistance. And if you decrease total peripheral resistance, you decrease the blood pressure. So this is another mechanism that they've seen associated with thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics. They don't really know what's the thing responsible. How do thiazides cause vasodilation? They think it may be responsible from prostaglandins. Through some way, shape, or form, there's these prostaglandins and that thiazides, by some way, 
help to stimulate the prostaglandin production and that prostaglandins help to promote this vasodilation mechanism. So now if we understand then that thiazide and thiazide like diuretics basically inhibit sodium and chloride reabsorption via the sodium chloride co-transporter, less sodium chloride in the blood, less water is going to be driven into the blood. Therefore, there's a decreased blood volume. That decreased blood volume can decrease blood pressure. So we can see how this would be very helpful in patients with hypertension. Very, very beneficial drug in hypertension. Here's another thing that I want you to remember. So again, go back to the whole concept here. With these drugs, you decrease sodium and you decrease chloride re reabsorption. That decreases the water reabsorption that decreases their blood volume. And by decreasing blood volume, you decrease blood pressure. So that's how that would be helpful in this sense. What about in other situations where they have a high blood volume, right? So someone has a large blood volume and you want to prevent that excessive continual fluid overload. Well, what about in situations where someone has fluid overload maybe within their peripheral extremities, maybe in their legs. So someone has peripheral edema, okay? So they have peripheral edema. What could that be due to? There's multiple causes of peripheral edema. Could be due to CHF, could be due to cirrhosis, could be due to an acute kidney injury, right? Or nephrotic syndrome, something of that nature, where they're basically accumulating fluid within the peripheral the tissue spaces in the legs. Or another thing that can happen is, besides having peripheral edema, they can have pulmonary edema. And this pulmonary edema, again, what could be the cause of it? It could be CHF, it could be cirrhosis, it could be acute kidney injury or some type of nephrotic syndrome. And again, what's happening is a lot of fluid is accumulating where? Well, the fluid is accumulating particularly within the interstitial spaces. And as that fluid starts to accumulate, it makes it very difficult to breathe. Same thing, as we start to accumulate lots of fluid in the legs, it can lead to increased pressure pain, swelling, right? What's another thing where there's someone that could be fluid overloaded? Another situation where someone could be fluid overloaded is maybe ascites. And what could be the cause of ascites? Well, again, it could obviously be cirrhosis, which is causing, you know, a backup of fluid through the portal circulation. It might even be related to CHF. We don't know, but there could be tons of different causes of why someone could have ascites. But the whole point is, with all of these, the patient is fluid overloaded. Well, what can we do? Well, if we give them a thiazide or thiazide-like diuretic, these aren't the best with these, but they can be utilized. You're going to decrease sodium, and you're going to decrease chloride reabsorption. You're going to decrease water pull into the blood, which is going to decrease blood volume. Wouldn't that be helpful in a someone who's already fluid overloaded, and you don't want to continue to increase their blood volume? this would be a situation where we could give these drugs. Are they the absolute best? No, you'd be more likely to use something like a loop diuretic, but they can be utilized either alone or, remember what I told you, in combination with a loop diuretic. So we could take a thiazide diuretic like metolazone, the thiazide-like diuretic, combine it with a loop diuretic and pull off some of the excess fluid in someone who has peripheral edema, pulmonary edema, or ascites due to an underlying etiology like CHF, cirrhosis, or AKI. See, that's what we understand about this drug. Okay, now we understand it can be utilized in hypertension. We know that it could be utilized e either monotherapy, but more commonly, dual therapy with a loop diuretic. So it's important to remember that whenever we're talking about this situation of edematous states, pulmonary edema, peripheral edema, or ascites, we could utilize these drugs either as monotherapy, not as common, but more commonly as dual therapy with the utilization of a loop diuretic like furosemide. Okay, now that we understand that, let's talk about the other indications for this drug. This next one's actually really interesting. In someone who has what's called nephro genic diabetes insipidus. Okay, so diabetes insipidus is basically when someone uh, doesn't make, right, enough antidiuretic hormone, okay? So, you know, you're, you're uh, basically you have your hypothalamus, 
and it has these uh, neurons called supraoptic nucleus and it has the paraventricular nucleus which extend down into the posterior pituitary and they release a hormone called ADH. Well, in diabetes insipidus, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, the ADH production, here's the key thing, is normal. Okay? So ADH, what does it do? It circulates through the blood and it comes to the area of the collecting duct. You know in the collecting duct, you have specific receptors here, and these are called V2 receptors, vasopressin, that's another name for ADH. What it does is it binds onto these V2 receptors and then it signals, basically the end result here, is it signals the production of the aquaporins. And it puts these little pores into the cell membrane here. And as I put these little pores into the cell membrane, the whole goal of this is that we're going to pull water from the tubular lumen into the tubular cell and as a result, pull that water into the blood. Okay, so then from here, we know that this is gonna go into the bloodstream. Okay? But, here's the problem. In nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, the V2 receptor doesn't function properly. And so the ADH production is normal, but the V2 receptor, which responds to the ADH, isn't functioning properly. So the overall result is gonna be the same. There's not going to be the activation of the aquaporins. If there's not aquaporins being pulled in, what's gonna happen? That means less water. And that decrease in water in the blood is a problem here, right? Because now, what's gonna happen is you're gonna actually lose a lot of water into the urine. Tons of water into the urine. Now, here's something you guys are probably like trying to think about. Why in the world would I give someone a thiazide diuretic if they're already losing water because the aquaporin units aren't being you know, basically synthesized properly and expressed on the cell membrane? Here's why. Thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics produce what's called a mild hypovolemia, right? So in other words, they decrease. Here's what I want you to remember. What do we say happens? There's a decrease in sodium and there's a decrease in the chloride reabsorption. If there's a decrease in the sodium reabsorption, decrease in the chloride reabsorption, that's going to decrease the water reabsorption. If you decrease the water reabsorption, that's going to decrease the blood volume. Now, Here's what's really interesting. If you decrease the blood volume, you decrease the blood flow through the glomerulus. A decreased blood flow through the glomerulus leads to a decreased glomerular filtration rate. What that means is, is now the proximal convoluted tubule has more time to reabsorb sodium, chloride, and thereby water, okay? So, if you remember what we just talked about, you decrease blood volume. That means that there's less blood flowing through the glomerular capillaries. That means that less blood is being filtered off into this Bowman's capsule, and less of this actual filtrate is moving into the proximal convoluted tubule. What that means is that's more time in the proximal convoluted tubule that we can reabsorb sodium, reabsorb chloride, and thereby water. Because in patients with diabetes insipidus, what are they doing? They're losing tons of water, and maybe even a little bit of salt. If we give them a thiazide or thiazide-like diuretics, you induce a mild hypovolemia, which then triggers the proximal convoluted tubular cells to increase their reabsorption of sodium, chloride, and water. So now there's less sodium, less chloride, and less water getting down to the level of the collecting duct. And so I'll, I'll lose less water in the urine. So that's trying to help me in the overall end. So that's what's more really cool about this drug uh, in this situation here. The next thing I want you to remember here, and it's indications. Remember what I told you that in this area of the uh, distal convoluted tubule, what else did it do? Remember, it helped to transport calcium into the blood, right? There was an increase in the calcium movement into the blood. 
If there's an increase in calcium movement into the blood, why is that important? Well, think about this. What about in a situation where someone has high amounts of calcium in their urine? What does that predispose them to, especially if they have phosphates and oxalates that they can also combine with? It increases the risk of renal stones. So this would be helpful in somebody who actually forms kidney stones due to hypercalciuria. And there can be many different reasons for this. We're not going to go into detail on that. But in someone who is predisposed because they have hypercalciuria, you give them a thiazide, thiazide like diuretic, you're going to pull some of that excess calcium out of the kidney tubules and prevent the formation of kidney stones. What about in a person who's also osteopenic? This helps to increase the calcium reabsorption. And if you increase calcium reabsorption, you therefore help to do what? Stimulate calcitonin production. And that calcitonin production is gonna increase osteoblastic activity and lead to bone deposition, which is important in a person who already has very weak bones. Okay? So, indications that I want you to remember with this drug, hypertension, big one. It can be utilized monotherapy, less common, in fluid overloaded states, more common dual therapy if necessary, in utilization with a loop diuretic in situations like peripheral edema, pulmonary edema, or ascites, secondary to CHF, cirrhosis, or AKI, or nephrotic syndrome. It can also be used in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, which is in a situation where they have normal ADH, but abnormal V2 receptors, so they don't reabsorb water and lose a lot of water into the urine. If you give them thiazides, it helps to basically through a mechanism of causing mild hypovolemia, increased reabsorption, and chloride and water in the proximal convoluted tubule, which helps to lead to less water loss. And the last thing is it also increases calcium in the bloodstream, so it helps in patients who have increased risk of hypercalciuria, which can cause kidney stones, as well as maybe those who are osteopenic, who have very brittle, weak bones, okay, and maybe even osteo parotic individuals. All right, so now that we understand the mechanism of action, the different drugs, okay, as well as the indications of thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics, let's talk about some of the potential side effects and ADRs because these commonly come up in your, your boards, okay? So one of the big things that you want to remember is, you know, in the proximal convoluted tubule, you have these specific types of transporters, and they're called organic acid or anion transporters. So organic acid or anion transporters. And what they do is you have this molecule waste product called uric acid. And uric acid is designed to be excreted via these transporters. So in order for me to push uric acid from the blood into the tubular cell, I need this organic ion tra anion transporter. Then from here, there's another transporter that pushes this from the tubular cell and into the tubular lumen. And then now, this uric acid that I push out here should then go and become excreted in the urine. Well, whenever you give drugs like thiazide or thiazide-like diuretics, what they do is, through some mechanism, they inhibit the organic anion transporters. So, if you inhibit the transporter that pushes uric acid into the cell and thereby uric acid into the tubular lumen, this can't get into the cell. What happens to the uric acid level in the blood? That sucker starts rising. So now the uric acid level in the blood is going to rise. What do you call that whenever the uric acid level in the blood rises? This is called hyperuricemia. What is the issue with hyperuricemia? What kind of patients would we be very concerned about these sodium, like these uric crystals getting deposited into particular joints like the metatarsal phalangeal joint and the big toe? This could lead to it depositing into the joints and leading to gout. Because again, these uric acid leads to monosodium uric crystals and they deposit into particular joints and one of the most common joints is the MTP, the first MTP and it can lead to very exquisite pain and tenderness. So that's one thing that we have to worry about. That's a potential side effect. The other side effect here is again, remember we have again, the sodium chloride, okay, co-transporters. And again, what did they do? Well, remember that these thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics inhibit these. And thereby, this leads to less sodium 
being reabsorbed and less chloride being reabsorbed, okay? So now because of that, because less sodium and less chloride are being reabsorbed, that leads to more chloride and more sodium being retained in the kidney tubules. As more sodium is retained in the kidney tubules, you pee this out, right? So now what's gonna end up in the urine? One of the things that's gonna end up in the urine is more sodium than usual. What does it call whenever you have low sodium now? So now there's less sodium that's being transported into the blood. What's that called when there's less sodium in the blood? Less sodium in the blood is called hyponatremia. Okay, so that's another potential complication of this, another potential side effect. The other thing is, again, you're gonna lose chloride in the urine. So now you're gonna have lots of chloride that shows up in the urine. And what's it called whenever you have low chloride in the blood? So now less chloride is gonna get transported into the blood. And this will lead to hypochloremia. Now, we're gonna talk about why that's significant in just a second. The other thing I want you to remember is what else happened here. Remember that we had the sodium and we had the chloride and they move in via the sodium chloride co-transporter. Sodium moves out via the sodium potassium ATPase. And then in order for the sodium to get back into the cell, it allows for an exchange from sodium moving into the cell and calcium going out of the cell and into the blood. This creates an osmotic gradient, or I'm sorry, a concentration gradient that pulls calcium from the tubular lumen into the tubular cell. And then that calcium again is gonna get pulled via the sodium calcium exchanger into the blood. What's that result in? If there's increased calcium in the blood, hypercalcemia. Okay, so we have hypercalcemia, hypochloremia, hyponatremia, and hyperuricemia as potential side effects. And again, the overall concept here is that you're gonna get less calcium that's gonna get shown up in the urine. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Now, if there's more sodium, right, because less sodium is getting reabsorbed, more sodium moving from the distal convoluted tubule into the collecting duct. So now we're at the collecting duct. More sodium is moving down through the collecting duct than previous, all right? What happens is this creates a concentration gradient where sodium is gonna be in lower concentration inside of this tubular cell in the collecting duct and in higher concentration than usual in the tubular lumen. And what happens is sodium is gonna to wanna to move, a little bit of the sodium is gonna to wanna to move into this actual tubular cell. And then from here, again, you have the sodium potassium ATPases that pumps the sodium out and then it'll go into the blood. Here's the point that's really interesting. If positive ions are moving into the cell because sodium is moving into the cell and positive ions are leaving the tubular lumen, what happens to the charge inside of the tubular lumen as you lose sodium? It becomes negative. As it becomes negative, it attracts specific types of cations that are present inside the cell like potassium and protons. And this potassium will leak out of the cell these protons will leak out of the cell more than usual. And what's gonna happen now? I'm gonna lose potassium, more potassium than usual in the urine, and I'm gonna lose more protons in the urine. So as a result, if someone has less potassium in the blood, what is that called? That's called hypokalemia. And the other thing is if there's less protons, because I'm excreting protons, if there's less protons in the blood, that can lead to alkalosis. And this isn't re related to the respiratory system, this is related to your metabolic system. So this is a metabolic alkalosis. So do you see how there's some potential side effects from these drugs, right? So there's a potential of metabolic alkalosis, there's the potential of hypokalemia, hypochloremia, hyponatremia, hyperuricemia. All right, so this is actually really cool. It took me a little bit to kind of figure out how thiazides can cause hyperglycemia because you want to understand why these things happen. Well, here's one of the big things. If there's less potassium 
in the blood, we can kind of say that what's gonna happen is more potassium is gonna leave these cells to try to compensate for that. So overall then, what's gonna happen is the potassium concentration inside of the cell is gonna be lower than usual, okay? Now, here we have a specific cell and we're gonna focus on what's called the pancreatic beta cell. Now the pancreatic beta cell has specific types of glut transporters. And what they do is they bring glucose from outside the cell and they bring it into the cell. And then you guys know that what happens is glucose eventually through multiple mechanisms will lead to the synthesis of ATP. ATP is very interesting because what happens is it has a very specific type of binding site on this ATP sensitive potassium channel. And when ATP binds onto this channel, it closes the potassium channel. And so now potassium can't leak out, okay? But what happens is there's already less potassium inside of the cell. So because there's less potassium than usual inside of the cell, what happens as there's, you know, usually what happens is you have lots of positive ions that build up in the cell. As this channel closes, the potassium ions can't exit, they accumulate inside of the cell, and they cause a slight positive charge. But there's less potassium in the cell. So that's less of a positive charge. That means less activation of these voltage-gated calcium channels. So that what that means is less calcium is going to enter into the cell. If there's less calcium, why is that important? Because you know calcium is responsible for stimulating these vesicles which contain insulin. And insulin, when, when calcium rushes into the cell, it causes this vesicle to fuse with the cell membrane and release insulin into the bloodstream. But again, we have low potassium inside of the cell. Normally, the ATP binds to the ATP sensitive potassium channel, and normally potassium can't leave the cell, so it builds up inside the cell, causes a positive charge enough to activate the calcium channels. They open, calcium rushes in, and stimulates insulin release. But because we have lower than normal potassium storage because of the thiazide, thiazide like diuretics, there's less of a positive charge inside the cell, and there's less activation of the voltage gated calcium channels less calcium rushes into the cell and less insulin is released. Why is that important? Because if you remember, here we'll have a cell and here we're gonna have an insulin receptor. And what does insulin do? Insulin binds on to an insulin receptor and basically triggers the activation of transporters that will move glucose from outside the cell, inside the cell. Okay, and effectively, the whole purpose of moving glucose into the cell is to decrease blood glucose levels. Well, if you have less insulin being produced, that means less glucose movement into the cell, and that means that less blood glucose uh, is getting cleared and put into the cell, that means the blood glucose levels are going to rise. And this can lead to hyperglycemia. So this is how that actually happens. And it's actually pretty darn cool. The last thing that I wanna talk about here is again, remember I brought up a point with that some of these drugs, particularly the thiazide-like diuretics, they have a sulfa group. And remember that sulfa group, what it can do is it can, if someone has a sulfa allergy, or in general, sulfa drugs can lead to a particular type of reaction. And this reaction is called acute interstitial nephritis. And with acute interstitial nephritis, what happens is it's a classic triad of symptoms that people can develop because of a reaction to this sulfa drug. Because again, this is particularly from the thiazide-like drugs that have that sulfa group. This can create an acute interstitial nephritis via a sulfa drug reaction. And what can happen is this can lead to a triad of symptoms. One is it can lead to arthralgias. The other is it can lead to a rash. The other classic symptom is acute kidney 
injury, particularly intrarenal, if we really want to be specific, intrarenal AKI. Another thing is if you actually check the bloodstream, one of the things that happens as a result to this actual drug and this sulfa drug reaction is if you check a CBC, they also commonly have elevated eosinophils. Okay, so this is another potential type of side effect or adverse drug reaction that can happen, particularly to the thiazide-like drugs because of that sulfur moiety that they contain. All right, engineers, so in this video, we talk about thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics. We discuss their mechanism of action, the different types of drugs. We talk about the indications that they can be commonly utilized for. And we also talked about side effects and adverse drug reactions with these particular drugs. I hope it all made sense. I really hope that you guys did enjoy it. If you guys did, please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. As always, Ninja Nerds, until next time.